Okay, last week, a bunch of, man, time's flying, a bunch of you mentioned you wanted to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, and I wasn't quite sure why or about what, but I, I love it. Speak of difficult passages, how many Christians live out the Sermon on the Mount? And it is so otherworldly of how human thinking and wisdom works. So, so we don't have to um, look at them all. I love that picture. But here's the Sermon on the Mount broken down into sections. So it starts with the Beatitudes, blessed are, wonderful. And it's interesting who the blessed people are, right? It's not the heroes, the warriors, the strong, the powerful, the rich, the beautiful. It's the poor, the broken, the meek, the lowly. Once Jesus just starts by flipping worldly wisdom right on its head, right out the chute. Disciples and the world, um, how we're to relate to other people, also personal relationships. That's where it talks about um, labor, um, conscription, um, marriages, adultery, those sorts of things. Non-retribution, um, I really wish more Christians would focus on this part of the path of the Sermon on the Mount, this, this idea that worldly wisdom says if someone does something to you, you do it back to them, maybe twice as much. But what Jesus is emphasizing here is this idea of turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, giving your cloak if someone sues you for your coat, um, giving to those that ask and turning not away, um, blessing those that curse us, praying for those that despitefully use us, that we may be perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. And it's just absolutely powerful and profound. And I, I want to before we move on, and we can talk about some of those other ones, but I want to talk a little bit about the non-retribution. And um, think about our culture. And I, when I think about my favorite movies over time, although I think my tastes are starting to change as I get older, but um, growing up, always my favorite movies were this idea where someone had been wronged or something horrible had happened to them, and the whole rest of the movie was the unfolding of how they got vengeance or retribution for the wrongs done to them. And favorite Western outlaw Josie Wales <laughs> with Clint Eastwood. And it's a two plus hour saga of vengeance and retribution. Um, Mel Gibson, um, Braveheart, The Patriot, all those movies, it's not about freedom or honor, it's about revenge, retribution, payback. You hurt me and mine, we're going to hurt you and yours. And Jesus is making it really clear, this is not the way of the cross. This is not how we are to respond. And it's powerful. And unfortunately, I think it's very lacking in American mentality and even American Christianity. Fasting, money, and prayer. Um, real simple. If we fast... We're to do it privately. It's between us and God. We're not to make a show about it. We're not to let people know what good little fasters we are. Same thing with our tithes and offerings. Um, it, be discreet. It's not to be a show. It's not to get yourself on the wall in the back of church or a brick in the building because you donated so much money. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, prayer. When we pray, go into your closet, talk to God in private, and he will reward you openly. Not that that should be the motivation, but he says, be not like the Pharisees who blow a trumpet and stand in the market and make a scene or spectacle of their prayers. And so I love this idea of this humility and contriteness of these things that is between us and God at his moving and his discretion. And it's, it's about him. And it's not about us and our ego and us seeking a reward. And it becomes really easy when we realize all we have belongs to God. All our wealth, all our money, all our time, all our possessions, 
this idea of tithing at ten percent is ridiculous to me in the sense that it all belongs to God, and we're not giving Him a token so that He can give us more. It's all His, and all is to be used at His discretion and and bidding. Cure for anxiety. What's the cure for anxiety? <clears throat> Actually, let's look up that passage. We live in anxious times. <clears throat> Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Got my blue letter Bible app. Okay, so this is starting in verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what you'll put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto your stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow was cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what? wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So what's the cure for anxiety? Living in the present. Yes, it's the only that, place we can live. That anxiety is all about the purpose of the future. One way or another. Your mic's a little rough, Roy. Oh, I'm sorry. I just said that anxiety involves being focused on the future, one way or another, and the lack of control we have about the future. Without, without you know, concern with the future, you don't have anxiety. That's right. Cure for anxiety. Give no the thought for the morrow. Tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you can't plan for the future. I don't think that's what Jesus implied. And it's the same with the past, right? If you're living in the past, that's where we have regrets or bitterness or resentment. That comes from living in the past, not in the present. Or anxiety and fear. Is it? Go ahead, Brooke. I was going to say that they say that's the source of depression is yes. being focused on the past, right? Yes. And um, so stop, stop living in the past. It doesn't mean we can't learn from the past. That's a good use for it. We can make corrections, recalibrations, just like we can plan for the future. But Jesus enjoins us to be present. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then your food, clothing, and shelter. God says he's got you covered. But you notice it's a short list. He's not talking big screen TVs and fast cars and vacation homes and all. He's talking your basics, your necessities, not all these pleasure items that we're obsessed with in our, our culture and that our wealth and affluence supports us. And we're so far past the basics, right?